Why did Jesus die for you? To save me from sin and give me a home in heaven. Is that all? Yeah. Isn't that enough? Well, salvation is a great gift, and heaven will be wonderful. But what about life in between? You mean for today? Something to help in life? <laughs> That'd be cool. There's a lot more to salvation that'll make a difference in everything you do. I like that. I'm Dan Norton, and on this edition of Back to the Bible, Woodrow Kroll takes a closer look at one of the reasons Jesus died on the cross. It's not just about the future. It's about right now, too. Our study is taken from the book of Titus. Let's join Dr. Kroll for a study recorded during a recent Bible conference. Will you take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading at verse 11. Titus 2, 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now, if I say to you that Jesus died for me because he loves me, that gives you the emotional answer. He does love me. But there is a practical answer as well why Jesus died for you and me. And the practical answer is found right here in verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now that's a twofold answer. Jesus gave himself for us, number one, that he might redeem us, and number two, that he might purify us. Now I'm interested today in this first response. He gave himself to redeem us. This is probably a negative response to the question because you see, there was a problem in the world and the problem was you and me. And God looked down from heaven and saw this problem. He was not at all unaware of it. He knew the problem was going to be there even before it came. And he sent his son to die for you and me. Now, I hate to start a message like this by getting into a foreign word, but in actuality, there are three words in the New Testament that relate to redemption, three words for redeem in the New Testament. The first word is the word agorazo in the original language, and that simply means to buy a slave out of the marketplace. That's the word most of us are familiar with, agorazo. The second word is ek agorazo with the E-K on the front, it means out of, like we have an exit sign at the entrance or the exit of most places. Ek agorazo simply means to buy out or buy up or buy from. And it means that once you have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, you will never again be put on the auction block. He bought you up and you're bought up forever. Now here in Titus chapter 2 verse 14, he does not use the word agorazo. And he does not use the word ek agorazo. He uses a third word, and it is the word lutrao. And the word lutrao simply means to set free by the payment of ransom. So the blood of Jesus Christ paid a ransom so that you and I could be set free. That's what it means to redeem us. Jesus paid the ransom so that you and I could be set free. Now, if you're still in your sin today, if you have never come to understand or to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today, the ransom has been paid, friends. It's already paid. You just haven't gotten the news that it's paid for you. And you haven't allowed that ransom to be appropriated to your life. And you can do that today. Because the ransom once paid is paid once for all forever. And once you're bought up by the Lord Jesus Christ, bought out by the Lord Jesus Christ, you'd never go back to the auction block again, not for anyone or any reason. It's important then to recognize that Jesus Christ died to redeem us. 
Now, Paul borrows language from the Old Testament here. I'm going to turn back to Psalm 130 because I want to see that the psalmist uses exactly the same terminology. Psalm 130, verses 7 and 8 read this way. O Israel, hope of the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Now, when they wanted to make a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint, when they wanted to make a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, they came to this verse, verse 8 of Psalm 130, and they used the word ek, E-K, which means out of, for the word that is translated in English, from. So they translated this, he shall redeem Israel out of all his iniquities. Now think with me a moment. If the blood of Jesus Christ redeems you out of all iniquity, then it separates you from that iniquity. If the blood of Jesus Christ redeems you out of your sin, out of lawlessness, then it separates you from lawlessness. But that's not the word Paul chose to use when he referred to it here in Titus 2.14. In Titus 2.14, he says, who gave, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Paul chose to use a different word, not ek, out of, but apo, A-P-O, from. In essence, what Paul is saying is that the blood of Jesus Christ did more than buy me out of the marketplace. The blood of Jesus Christ did more than buy me out of my sin. The blood of Jesus Christ did more than buy me out of the place where I found myself a sinner. The blood of Jesus Christ did more than pay a ransom and buy me. The blood of Jesus Christ bought me away from where I was as well. From, away from. So that what he is saying is simply this. Jesus died not just to rescue me from hell. Oh, that's great. And that's the thing most of us look for. But that's not why Jesus died. He didn't die just to rescue us from hell. He died to rescue us from where we were as well. He died to rescue us from the old neighborhood as well. Jesus redeemed us to buy us away from where we live, away from those old friends, away from those old haunts, away from those old places, away from those old practices. Redemption means to be bought away from them, not just out of them. And the purpose of Paul writing this was clear. He wanted the people reading this passage of Scripture to understand that Jesus Christ makes an eternal difference in your life. When Jesus comes in, old things are passed away. All things become new. When Jesus comes in, there is not just a new gleam in your eye. When Jesus comes in, there's a new future. There's a new destiny for you. So it's being bought away from these old places, away and giving us a new neighborhood, a new place to live, new friends perhaps, new attitudes toward life. We are turned inside out, upside down when Jesus Christ comes into our lives. Now Timothy and Titus and Philemon and other young men who were around Paul on frequent occasion were not theologians like the apostle was. They were not trained rabbis like the apostle. And so while Paul wants these young Christians to understand that they are purchased out of the marketplace of sin, he wants these young Christians to understand that there is more to salvation than just that. And one of the difficulties, of course, in our Christian lives is when we see salvation as only fire insurance, when we see it as only an escape from hell, when we don't see it as being bought away from the old things, but out of and away from our sinful life. Jesus Christ gave his life for me to change my life, to make a difference in my life, to move me in a new direction, to give me a new future, to create an eternal destiny for me that I did not have before. And what he did for me, he did for everyone here. He did for you as well. Jesus Christ makes a difference in life, and only he is the one who is acceptable to the Father to change your life and change my life. Have you been bought out by the Lord Jesus? Or are you still running business as usual, the business of life? 
Have you been bought away from the old places of sin, the old attitudes of sin, the old habits of sin? Have you been bought away from them, or are they still clinging to you rather tightly? Have you viewed your salvation as just a way to get to heaven, or do you view it as God views it, a way to live, a way to enjoy salvation now as well as salvation in the future? When Paul writes to young Titus, he wants Titus to understand that there are two reasons why Jesus Christ died. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, relates to the Lord Jesus and tells Titus exactly why Jesus died. The first reason is this, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed. Jesus Christ died to redeem me from my sin. He died to buy me out. He died to buy me away from those old places of sin. Now, I am more than happy, friends, and I'm sure you are as well, more than happy to receive from the Lord God redemption. I am more than happy to understand that redemption means I am bought up. I am bought out. I am more than happy to know that I will never again be back on the auction block. I'm happy about all that. But there's more. And the second reason why the Lord Jesus paid a redemption for me is a reason that some of us never seem to get to in life. The second reason why God loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me is a reason that somehow I just never seem to think about. You notice what it is? Titus 2, 14 who gave himself for us that he might redeem us with er from every lawless deed and, and purify for himself his own very special people, people who are zealous for good works. Now, the second reason why God loves me and the second reason why Jesus died for me is not just to redeem me. That's a negative connotation. You see, the Lord Jesus came out of heaven on a rescue mission. And he rescued me in my sin. And he brought me to the Lord God of salvation. And he presents me to him as if I were righteous. The good shepherd came out and got the sheep that had wandered astray. That was me. And that was you. But now that I am in the shepherd's arms, I find something else. And that is that I am safe in his arms. I am washed in his arms. I am saved in his arms. And like any other sheep that has just run away... I am smelly in his arms, and so are you. You see, just because I'm saved, just because I once who was lost am now found, just because I am in the arms of the Savior does not mean I am very much like the Savior. And there is an other side to the redemption story. This is the positive side to the redemption story. And it is this. Jesus not only died to redeem me, he died to purify me as well. Jesus not only died to buy me out or buy me back or buy me away from the old places of sin, but he died to make me something special for him as well. And isn't it a shame that so many people today are willing to stop with the first reason they're content just to be on their way to heaven and they're not content to receive from the Lord God everything he has for us, that abundant life which the Lord Jesus makes reference to. You see, God didn't save me just to redeem me. He saved me to sanctify me as well. The first purpose for his salvation, the first purpose for the death of Jesus clearly is salvation. But the second purpose for Jesus' redemption, the second purpose for his death, is clearly my sanctification. And both of those are provided for in the death of Jesus Christ. The ransom was quickly paid, but the rest of life is a long journey, friends. You've been listening to a conference message recorded by Woodrow Kroll, who, by the way, has now returned to the studio. Would you began today by reminding us of the great work of redemption that Jesus did on the cross? You used a word that described how a slave was purchased from the marketplace. That's not something we readily understand. Uh, tell us what actually happened when slaves were purchased back in the first century. 
Well, slaves existed in several different forms in biblical times, both Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, People could become a slave because they were poor and they were unable to pay their debts. Uh, Sometimes a thief who could not repay what he had stolen became a slave. Children born of slave parents became slaves automatically. Slaves could buy their own freedom if they had the money, and most of them did not. Or someone else could buy their freedom for them. They then became a free man. Now, spiritually, that's what's happening to us when we're saved. Except we can't buy our own freedom. Jesus' death on the cross did that for us. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We became free from the guilt of our sin. We became free from the penalty of our eternal death. And when we accept the gift of freedom that Jesus gave to us when he purchased it on our behalf at Calvary, that's when we're born again. Well, no slave, once they've received their freedom, would ever want to go back to the old slavery again, would they? Uh, But we do that. Why? Well, there's an added component in spiritual slavery, and that's the presence of Satan in the world. He makes sin appear attractive, uh, inviting, uh, sometimes something we can't do without. And some people wander back into the habits of slavery that they were saved from because they're spiritually immature. They don't have the power of the Holy Spirit controlling their lives. There are lots of reasons. They don't come under the penalty of sin once again when they wander back into sin. We're saved from that. Once we're saved from that, we're saved from that forever. But we do come under the power of sin, and it sometimes can lead us to a life of defeat. That's why it's important for us, Dan, to stay out of the places, away from the people that we once knew when we were living in sin. 